Thank you. Hi, everybody. How's it going? Good. Good. Okay, I'm going to be real with you guys. We probably met, I don't know, tens of thousands of people. Somebody gave me some germs, so I have my tissues up here. Please don't be offended. And we have our cameraman here. I'm congested. If I have to blow my nose, I'm sorry, sir. It's going to be right in your microphone. Uh, but it's real. I'm Lauren Underwood. I'm a 32-year-old nurse from Naperville. I went to Nequa Valley. And I'm running for Congress here in the Illinois 14th District. Um, I'm a nurse. And I've spent my career working to expand health care coverage in communities across our country. Uh, first, by working to implement the Affordable Care Act at the federal level. I worked on private insurance reform and health care quality in the Medicare program. Also worked on preventive services, those free screenings and vaccines and contraceptive coverage. And then joined the Obama administration where I worked on public health emergencies and disasters. Things like Ebola and Zika and the water crisis in Flint. And it was during our time in Flint that the 2016 election happened. And I thought that we'd have a chance to hand off our work on Flint and hand off our work on health reform to a team that cared and a team that would want to continue forward with that progress. But instead, we got the Trump team who made it immediately clear that they wanted to take away health care coverage from the American people. And that's not why I became a nurse or did any of this work. And so I knew that I could not stay in government and help them do that. And so I decided to return home to Illinois. Our state expanded Medicaid under the ACA. And I began working for a Medicaid managed care company in Chicago when I found myself at Mr. Holcren's one and only public event of 2017 with a question and answer session over at the Arcata, hosted by the League of Women Voters, and that night he made a promise. He said he was only going to support a version of Obamacare repeal that let people with pre-existing conditions keep their health care coverage. And as a nurse, that kind of promise was really important to me because I'd taken care of patients who rely on their coverage in order to afford medications or any procedures that they need. And then in working on the Affordable Care Act, I've read the law and I know that it works and that we can fix what didn't work. We don't have to throw the whole thing away. And like so many Americans, I have a pre-existing condition myself. It's a heart condition and it's well controlled, but it's one of these diagnoses that counts as a pre-existing condition. And so when he made that promise, I believed him because it was personal. And then uh, he went and voted for the American Health Care Act which is the version of repeal that did the opposite, made it cost prohibitive for people like me to be able to get insurance coverage. And I got really upset because I believe that representatives should be transparent and honest about their votes. Uh, they should be accessible to our community and ultimately they should be accountable to us, the voters. And he didn't seem to recognize any of that. So I decided, you know what? It's on, I'm running, and I launched the campaign in August of 2017. Ended up running in the Democratic primary. I beat six guys. I got 57% of the vote. I don't think I've met any of you. I came in March uh, to talk with uh, the class, the government class there. Um, uh, but anyways, got 57% of the vote, and now taking on Mr. Holcren directly. We've out fundraised him all year. Uh, we literally helped scare him out of hiding. <laughs> he was absent for 16 months, didn't show up to town halls, public meetings, anything like that. And so now he's back, um, came back starting in August of 2018, and now he's, you know, doing a few things ahead of the election. And we have 22 days. 22 days until this whole district goes and votes and we have the opportunity to elect uh, a representative who will continue to show up for our community and listen and carry forward our voices in Washington. So I'm really glad to be here to see all of you. Um, I'm assuming that some of you are 18 and able to vote. Is that a fair assumption? Yes, okay. And for those of you who are 18 or will be 18 by the 6th, I'm assuming you're all registered to vote. Is that a fair assumption? Anybody who's eligible to vote but not registered? No? You guys are so good. That's great. Are you excited? Or is this like, uh, well, let me, let me rephrase. For those who are eligible to vote and registered, like, do you want to share how you feel about voting? Or is there like no feeling at all? <laughs> Okay, so it sounds like there may be no feeling at all. This is just like something you have to do. No? No, okay. So it's not what you have to do. So what does it mean? I feel kind of um, pressured by a lot of people around me. Like, I feel like you should do research and you know what you're going for. It's like there's so many components that are going into what is in the chance. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, and so you say you feel a lot of pressure from people. Um, so do you feel like you know where to go for that information? Yeah. Oh, you do? Like Google? No, I actually went to my government teacher and oh. she uh, wasn't really able to talk to me like a lot because she's not allowed to. Mm -hmm. But she gave us like, good links. Mm. <laughs> okay, excellent. So is it fair to say we have a number of undecided voters here? Or do you guys sort of know where you, what you're doing in terms of voting? No. Okay. That's very exciting. Well, I'm pumped for you all. My first election was in 2004, uh, and I had to do the absentee voting because I was in college. And it was sort of anticlimactic. You get to actually go in, <laughs> which is way more fun. So I'm so delighted for you. Um, I want to answer whatever questions you have. Uh, let's take the conversation where you want to go. Um, I don't have, we don't even have to talk about the race if you don't want to. We can talk about whatever you want. Um, so what's on your mind? Um, happy, to, happy to chat. Any questions? No? Yes? Uh, where do you lie on the trial for a cat? Where do I lie? The trial. So interesting you said that because it's not a trial. Uh, a what? Yes, so uh, Brett Kavanaugh was nominated to the Supreme Court. And I personally had some concerns with his nomination. Prior to Dr. Ford uh, coming forward with her allegation, uh, I found that Mr. Kavanaugh displayed an unusual amount of partisanship, which is not what we generally hope to see on the Supreme Court. Uh, usually we like for our justices to be unbiased completely so that when a case comes before them they're able to look at the facts of the case only when making their determination about legality. Um, and it seems that he has demonstrated a particular loyalty to a party which we have found, which I think is just interesting, for example, that President George Bush, George W. Bush, was doing such active advocacy on Judge Kavanaugh's behalf to make sure that the nomination passed. Like, that doesn't usually happen um, in that kind of a partisan way. And so, separate from the allegations of sexual assault, I was very concerned. <coughs> then when Dr. Ford came forward, um, I found the attacks on her character to be very troubling because we know that the Supreme Court is the highest court in the land. You cannot go beyond the su Supreme Court. And so to have a nominee that has a credible allegation of such a heinous crime like sexual assault made me nervous and something, and for me that's unsettling. So the hearings were not designed to be the courtroom, right? This is not due process. They were not going to investigate and then say that he had to go to jail. This was just to determine whether or not it was credible. And um, I feel like if you have someone where you have to do that, they should not get the job. Just like if a teacher was applying to work here and there is an allegation of sexual assault and the FBI had to get called in, I suspect that most school districts would ultimately not offer the job because there's this kind of credible allegation. Um, and so, but here we are. The Senate confirmed him. He has a lifetime appointment. And I am personally reassured that under Article One of the Constitution, the Congress is a co-equal branch of government, equal in power to the executive branch and to the judicial branch. And so, the, this administration and the Senate may want to stack the court with these very partisan individuals, but the people have our voice through the Congress, um, and that's reassuring. Yes? Have you always lived in Illinois? Pardon me? Have you always lived in Illinois? Lived in Illinois? Okay. Have I always lived in Illinois? Yeah. Okay, so I was born in Ohio. My parents are from Cleveland both of them. And they actually met at a club, which I think is like so funny. Uh, they met at a club and got married and had my sister and I in Ohio. We moved to Naperville when I was three and lived in Naperville until the end of fifth grade. And then my dad got a job in Boston 
and at Polaroid. And so we lived in Boston for three years for middle school. And then they liked Naperville so much that we came back, seriously. And, but like Naperville's a nice place. And so uh, my family's been in that particular house in Naperville since 2000. I went to college at the University of Michigan, go blue. And I went to graduate school at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. And uh, then I worked in government um, from the time that we grad I graduated from Hopkins and stayed until the end of the Obama administration in 2017. And then came back. Yes. Um, can you talk about your work with Flint? Sure. Um, so in the beginning of 2017, I'm sorry, in 2016, in January, uh, the President Obama declared uh, an emergency in Flint, Michigan because of the lead contamination of the water. My boss was, her name is Nicole Lurie, and she's an Assistant Secretary at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. She was designated as the lead federal person in charge of the Flint water crisis. And so we supervised FEMA, we supervised the Environmental Protection Agency, all the other federal agencies that came into Flint, so like housing came in, and there were some people from the uh, Department of Justice who came in, and some people from the Department of Commerce who came in to sort of help that community, in addition to the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, and all these other federal folks. So we supervised that whole structure. And so we were there for the whole year. Um, until President Obama left office and then we had to leave. Otherwise, uh, we would have stayed in Flint until the crisis was solved. And so um, during that time in the very beginning, uh, the mayor of the city of Flint was just elected, but she didn't have power. So the city of Flint was a community that had gone broke, basically. And it was so bad that the state of Michigan had come in and taken over the day-to-day -day operations of the city. Um, and so when she got elected, they were beginning to transition those day-to-day -day operations from a state manager, basically, to the city. And so we were working with the mayor as she was getting her executive powers back. Um, we were working to help clean up the water system. We were giving them the cases of water every day. Um, and then folks in Flint started saying, sharing that they had um, experienced rashes and other physical symptoms as a result of um, showering or being exposed to this uh, contaminated water. So we did an investigation of that um, and worked with folks to make sure that as their pipes were getting replaced, because the federal government allocated a whole lot of money so that the whole community could they get their water pipes replaced, um, that they would be able to do so in a way that kept people healthy. And so I worked on it. We went to Flint every week, for the most part, every other week, some weeks. Um, President Obama came to Flint, um, and it was a very rewarding professional experience. But I have to tell you, I'm pretty disappointed that we had to leave before the job was done. Um, that community, there's a lot of people whose pipes have not been replaced yet. And that's because the mayor of Flint wanted to hire a construction crew that was based in her community so that the people that were working to replace the pipes were from Flint um, so that those jobs would be based in the community, the economic benefit, which is not why you do something like this, but if there's gonna be an economic benefit, it helps their community instead of a neighboring community or someone from Detroit or someone from out of state. And so, as a result, the um, replacement and construction's taking a long time because they don't have a bunch of different construction crews from that town, right? They just have a few. So, um, it's too bad uh, because a lot of people are still in pretty challenging circumstances um, and need some help, and this is not a priority for the Trump administration. Yes? So besides healthcare, what are your top legislative priorities? Yes, so healthcare is the number one issue in this election. Um, and we found it's mostly because of affordability, meaning insurance premiums, how much you have to pay to get your health insurance is very high, and the cost of prescription drugs is very high. 
Um, in this area, do you all know who the number one employer is in our whole congressional district? Now, I'm going to tell you where our congressional district covers to give you a little bit of a hint. But we have from the Wisconsin border in Lake County and McHenry County, out west to Northern Illinois University in DeKalb, and south to Shorewood, which is near Joliet. So seven counties in the western suburbs. Who do you think is the biggest employer in that whole area? Walmart. Walmart. Yeah. No, not Walmart. I went to a school last week and they said that too. I was surprised. <laughs> but not Walmart. Walmart. Target. All right. Okay, not retail. <laughs> you can take that off the table. Yes. State Farm. State Farm. No. Yes. Government. No. Good, good guess. That's not number one. Government's not number one. Number one is Six Flags, Great America. I know. That was my thought, too. And so it's awesome. It's awesome that we have Six Flags in our community. But when we think about the jobs at Six Flags, those are mostly seasonal part-time jobs because it's only open six months a year. And so when we think about our local economy, most people who live in our district work in and around Chicago, Cook County. They're not working here. We don't have major employers here. Now, when I was growing up in Naperville, we did, because we had much more of an agriculture <coughs> industry. We had a caterpillar plant and John Deere plant and a butterball plant, and there's people working in that space. When those jobs left, we didn't have big industry coming to backfill. And so now we are losing a lot of people every day to go and work in the city. So up in Crystal Lake, do you know where Crystal Lake is? North in McHenry County, okay. I was talking to their Chamber of Commerce, which is the organization that supports small businesses. They said that 75% of the residents of their county leave their county every day to work. 75%, huge numbers. That is not normal, okay. So when I think about nice communities like Batavia or Geneva or Naperville or Crystal Lake, um, our communities are great. People want to move in because they have wonderful schools like this. And people have yards and they can raise their families and do so in a really comfortable way. But if everybody's work or a lot of people's work is so far, when you think about commute time, over an hour into the city, as the city of Chicago gets safer and more attractive for particularly millennials, my generation, and Generation Z, your generation, everybody's not necessarily planning to come here and have three kids and a fence and a dog and drive a minivan, right? That's just not always the dream of our generation. Is that a fair assessment? Okay, so what happens to our communities? What happens to Batavia? In 10 years when you guys start having kids and you guys don't necessarily want to come back. There's nothing wrong with this community, but you all might want to do other things in life, right? Um, what happens when our parents, your parents, my parents, 15 years, 20 years, decide to downsize because they don't need a big house anymore. All their kids are gone. Your dad gets tired of cutting the grass and shoveling snow, right? What happens? We need people and families to want to move here. And the way to attract people is with jobs. In order for our communities to be able to grow, we need to have jobs here. And um, I don't see a lot of people talking about that. It's really concerning for me. In the absence of large employers, um, we have a lot of great small businesses. And I think it's important to continue to support those small businesses, but we need to do something to boost our local economy. So I get excited about infrastructure investment. So fixing our roads, these bridges, if you all head west in Kane County and into DeKalb County, just like look at the bridges as you drive over them. And then look in your rear view mirror at these big trucks carrying all this grain and gravel and think about if the bridge is really, because you know you drive over these bridges and it starts to wobble. Am I the only one that's experienced this? No, you guys have, right? Like that is not normal, that is not safe, that's not okay. These bridges have not been serviced in many cases in decades. We need to fix it, it's a safety hazard. Um, rural broadband, so internet access, connectivity. About 
An hour north of here in McHenry County, there are places where you literally cannot get high-speed internet access. It is a complete dead zone. We're talking about an hour and 15 minutes, hour and a half outside of Chicago, and there's that kind of a connectivity gap. That's not okay. If we want our economy to improve, people have to have basic things like internet. Crucial. And then commuter rail, Metra. So there's a Metra stop in Geneva. There's one in Aurora. There's one in Naperville. There's one in Crystal Lake. Uh, there's one in Elburn. We have two counties in our district, whole counties that don't have Metra. Kendall County, where Oswego is, in Oswego, talk about community growth. Oswego is the fifth fastest growing community in our whole state, meaning people have been moving there so rapidly. But they're so far from the highways. They're far from 88 and they're far from 55. So that means that for people to go to work, it takes forever. <laughs> it's so bad. You just sit in traffic for like an hour and a half. <laughs> and so the growth of their community has been slowing down and they're looking for a metro stop to help connect people to their jobs. And so we know that with, and DeKalb County, where Northern is, there's no train. Imagine if you wanted to go from campus to the loop. As a student, you might not have a car. And so that is less of an opportunity, right? But if it's connected by train, you can have an internship, uh, there's all kind of economic opportunities, you could have a job in the city. Um, and so we want to connect people to that economic engine while creating jobs. So when you have transit that comes in, you have hourly jobs, union, good union jobs, uh, engineering jobs, architects, executives, right? All the way up the ladder, you're employing people locally. I think it's really important. So supporting our economy, investing in infrastructure, I think is great. And then public education. Everywhere in our district, everywhere, Every community has good schools. And that's because people value public education here. They move here so that their kids, you guys, can go to great schools. Um, our representative is not someone that values public education. He talks about school choice, like Betsy DeVos. Do you guys know who Betsy DeVos is? No? OK. So there's a federal department of education, and she runs it. And. Um, she talks about school choice, meaning taking away resources from public schools to move to private schools. Now, in some communities, they have charter schools. Have you heard about that? Yes? OK. Does somebody need me to explain what a charter school is? OK, they have charter schools, they have voucher programs. They have these different options for people maybe who live in a community that don't have as much of an excellent public education system. But we don't have that. We have great schools like Batavia High School. We have some private religious schools like Marmion. And then a few folks that homeschool their kids. And so when he says school choice, he means taking away resources from places like this. And I think that that represents like a fundamental values misalignment. If people here support public school, our representative needs to support public school. Um, and every year, he proposes something called the Healthy Relationships Act. And what that bill says is that healthy relationships are intimate relations between a husband and wife in marriage. And if a school district does not teach that very narrow religiously motivated curriculum, their federal funds would be withheld. What? That kind of curriculum ignores LGBTQ people. It ignores sexually transmitted infections. And it's a way to cur curtail comprehensive sex ed or have your federal funds be withheld. Now, we deserve better than that, <laughs> quite candidly. Um, and it hasn't passed, but that's his dream scenario. And I think that's pretty poor. It shows where his values lie. Um, and so I believe, I'm a graduate of public education, believe that it's really important that all kids have access to the knowledge and the skills that they need to be competitive in our global marketplace. And uh, public education is vital to ensuring that that happens. So those are my top three. Healthcare, the economy, and education. Yes? How do you feel about net neutrality? Well, I'm very concerned about what happened with net neutrality. Everybody's familiar, or do we need to do a backstory? Familiar? 
No? Okay. So, for our whole lives, since there's been an internet, in the United States, you were able to log on, even in the dial-up days with AOL, which you guys might not even remember, oh my god. Uh, even in the dial-up dial days with AOL, you could go and visit any website you wanted and didn't ha get charged more. You could just go on ESPN.com and watch whatever clips you wanted to watch, the highlight reels, and it was fine. Then last year, um, uh, President Trump nominated a new head of the agency that regulates this kind of internet access. And he changed the net neutrality rules, which say that now companies, your internet provider, Comcast or Fios, Verizon Fios, or whoever you use, can charge different prices for different um, sites, basically. So if you wanted to use ESPN, that might not be in your package in the way that like your cable package, right? Some people have HBO and some people don't. They're trying to do that to internet, meaning you would have to pay more to go on Facebook, pay more to use Snapchat, pay more to use ESPN, pay more, depending on which sites you wanted to access. Um, and so that made people pretty concerned uh, because it's limiting people's access to information. And so I believe that the internet should be free and open and without these kinds of like virtual toll booths where you're always having to pay more to get access to certain sites. And so it's up to the Congress now to pass legislation that would supersede this agency's action. Right now the Congress has not moved forward on that legislation. Um, it's ended up becoming pretty partisan, whereas Republicans are siding with that agency saying it's okay to charge people more for this stuff, and the Democrats want it to be open. <coughs> Yes? What are your thoughts on Mike Madigan? What are my thoughts on Mike Madigan? Oh my God. Okay, you guys. Have you all seen the ad? Have you seen the ad? Okay, the Mike Madigan machine. You want to say it louder with the voice. Mike Madigan machine. That's right. Lauren Underwood and the Mike Madigan machine. Oh my God. And then there's one. There's two attack ads out against me right now. One of them, my favorite of the two, has me going like this, right? And like there's money coming down in the background. It's totally ridiculous. So to answer your question, I have never talked to Mike Madigan. I've never met Mike Madigan. I have, I don't know that man. And to make matters even more interesting, Mike Madigan runs the Democratic Party of Illinois. The Democratic Party of Illinois is such a challenging organization. They are the worst. They're the worst. And I'm not really supposed to say that, especially with a TV camera in my face, but I'm gonna tell you the truth. They're so difficult. And so um, I think it's really curious that my opponent has taken towards lodging this attack on me, which is blatantly false. There is not one, there's nothing on the internet, off the in internet, anywhere to connect me with Mike Madigan because it doesn't exist. It's just a lie. And he's put it on TV because he doesn't have a voting record to run on. And so all he can do is attack me and my character. And it's so false that CBS2 did a whole segment last week calling out the lies in his ad. Um, which I find to be very um, helpful because no one wants to see on a loop on cable news or on YouTube pre-rolls or anything all these lies about themselves. But um, that's what's going on with Mike Madigan, which is nothing, just to be clear. Yes? Have you thought about like, personally responding to that video with the video here? Well, I do it mostly in places like this. <laughs> because if I were to say something pretty publicly about it, let's say if I were to put like a press release out, you know what happens? Then they link to his ad and more people see his ad. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because they have to run the point counterpoint. And so right now, my opponent does not have enough money for his ad to be on broadcast television. My opponent does not have enough money for his ad to be shown in frequent rotation in every single cable channel in every corner of our district. So why would I help him do that? Why would I help him spread these lies about myself? I'm not going to. 
So I'm answering the question for you guys because you asked, and this local TV station just happens to be here. And if they cut this together and they insert his ad, it'll just, you'll understand why we don't usually do this. There's a question back here. Yeah? The most difficult part about campaigning, there are a lot of them. The first most difficult part was money. So when I started running for Congress, I was working full time. Working full time in my office in Chicago. And I would take the Metro downtown every day and then figure out how to do my campaign activities too. Because I was 30 and I'm a regular person. And I am not made of money. There is no rich uncle bankrolling this. There is no corporation bankrolling this. It is just us trying to figure it out. Us being like, this is Andrea. She is on my team. Uh, Mario's in the back with the scarf. She's on my team. Jake in the back. He went to Batavia High School, graduated a few years ago. He's on my team, right? But it's just us. We don't have like the mega bucks fueling this. So. I had to figure out how to raise money because if people don't help us by investing in our campaign, we'd be broke because I can't pay for it myself. And some candidates can, right? Like the governor, Governor Rahner can pay for it himself. J.B. Pritzker can pay for it himself. I can't do that. So I had to learn how to raise money, which means you have to literally call people and ask them for money all day, every day. And all summer, this summer, that is all I did for 40 plus hours a week. We were in this room, and I'm gonna be straight up with you guys. We were in this room, they had flies, it was hot. We were two doors down from a Dunkin' Donuts over in Naperville, and like when I would be just like losing my mind or falling asleep so bored after having left my 200th voicemail in a row asking for money, we would like go down to Dunkin' Donuts for five minutes just to get a break, to then come back and do it. But at the end of the day, we raised like $3.4 million now, something like that. And because of the way that our system works, you can only take $2,700 per person or $5,000 per organization. Like I'm a nurse, the American Nurses Association is supporting my campaign, they can give us 5,000. But if those of you who are 18 or if your parents wanted to give us money, they can only give us $2,700. So do you know how many calls and events you have to do to get that amount of money, right? It's hard. And just because you ask people for money doesn't mean they'll give it to you. Who here has been a Girl Scout? I was a, I'm a Girl Scout. I've been a Girl Scout my whole life. Now, those of us who are Girl Scouts, and the Boy Scouts selling the popcorn and the other things, it's similar, but a little different. Um, because the, girls, the Boy Scouts get a larger margin on what they sell. Girl Scouts, we sell these boxes of cookies for $4 a box-ish. And so the Girl Scouts make 70 cents on these boxes of cookies, which make it very difficult. You have to sell so many cookies in order to see a return. That's sort of like what this is, running for Congress. Right, you have to touch so many people to be able to raise in the volume that you need. It's been very difficult. Um, and when we talk about changes that we need to make in our system, the way that we fund <laughs> campaigns is one of these ways I think needs to see major changes. Um, so that's hard. Uh, the second thing that's been difficult is um, that let's say the beginning of your term you guys get a syllabus right that outlines what your assignments are what the criteria are to do well in your assignment and how you'll be graded so if you have a class like in college sometimes there's a curve so you're not judged just on your work you're judged on your work in relation to your peers curve sometimes it's weighted so if you get if you show up to every class, you get some bonus points, right? Um, things like that. But that's all outlined in the syllabus. Running for Congress, there's no syllabus. So literally every day the environment changes. Every day, literally. So if my opponent decides to partner up with the Koch brothers or the NRA, and they wanna drop half a million dollars in the race, that changes everything, literally. And we don't see it coming. If President Trump tweets, one, a two-line tweet, it could change everything. Um, if, I don't know, somebody walks into our office and offers a new piece of information or offers additional capacity, changes everything. 
And so it's just not straightforward. And so we all have goals, but because the environment's changing so much, it gets to be very difficult. Um, and so we have to build an organization that's flexible and that's nimble. And it's hard to do that in real time at, at scale, right? So I have 25 employees now, which is a lot. Um, but six months ago, there are five of us. And probably six months before that, there are two of us, right? So it's grown really quickly, but we have to be responsive to this changing environment all the time. What else is on your mind? Yes. So you've been like all over the district. All over. Um, have, have there been any like any stories or any venues that are particularly memorable to you? Lots of stories. Um, I met somebody, a guy, who um, his daughter is diabetic. His daughter is in elementary school, and she requires insulin every day. And the price of her daily dose of insulin is two thousand dollars a month, which is a lot, and he can't afford it. And so he was sharing with me the struggles that they have to pay for her medication and also be able to pay their bills every month because the price has just gone up and up and up. And he didn't know what to do because if his daughter doesn't have her insulin, then she gets really sick and can die. And he was asking me to help to fix the system so that the drug prices can be more under control. And I was really, I was really surprised to hear that because prior to his story, I didn't know that we were in the middle of that kind of a price spike again. Remember when the EpiPen uh, got really expensive? Do you guys remember that? And the difference is the EpiPen is one branded drug from one company. And that company was pretty greedy. And in the face of some real public pressure and some regulatory action, their prices started to come down. But insulin's different. That's a whole class of drugs across brands. It's sort of like saying cereal. Many different brands, different flavors, different types. Um, and that's not sustainable. For seniors, um, the price of insulin can be $2,300 a month on Medicare. And that was what really helped me understand the challenges around prescription drug prices um, in our area. Uh, but I've gone to all kinds of cool places. I went to Newark, Illinois. Do you guys know where that is? In Kendall County. It's a town of 800 people, and the whole town comes together for a week in like, it was in the winter, so maybe February, for something called a Kumla dinner. And I was like, well, what is Kumla? And they all go into the fire station in their small town, and it's like this charity thing, and it's a Norwegian dumpling that they serve in a broth with like some ham, and there's, and you drink it, you have it with milk and with like applesauce. Fascinating. And the people there love it. This is what they do every year. They had like the Boy Scouts busing the tables, the firefighters were serving the food. It was very sweet and very nice and I was glad to be there, but so far from any experience that I've ever had anywhere else. Uh, but it's been great. I think, honestly, you guys may choose to be political in your life or not, um, but I think it's a wonderful experience to be able to travel around and get to know your community in the way that I've had the opportunity to do so in running for Congress. To stand in the middle of a soybean farm and talk to the farmers about these tariffs, oh my God, and to like be up on the crop. You know, you drive past these things all the time, these beautiful stalks of corn and the soybeans and you know, never was, up close on them. I wasn't raised on a farm. Um, and so it, it's, been a, it's been really fun. I highly recommend it um, just as a life experience to work on a campaign or to run for office yourselves. Listen, our country needs your leadership, for real. You guys think I'm playing, but I'm not. If you look at the Congress, the number of people sitting in office right now who are 80, 85, Right? It's a lot of people. And they will not be holding these roles forever. We need you. We need you to be committed to serving our country and stepping forward to serve. 
And so I want you guys to think about it. Because something's going to happen one day that makes you mad or like clicks in like, I could do this. And then just remember this conversation that one day when you were in high school, this woman came in <laughs> who got mad when she was 30 and decided to run for Congress and came to tell you about it. And just let that remind you that you can do it too. That's one of the great things about the United States. We have a system where a regular person can get her name on the ballot and a regular person can travel around the community and earn support. That doesn't just happen. It's one of the great beauties of our Constitution and this democracy that we have. We have to protect it. Do you have a question in the corner? Do you have a question? No? OK. You had a question in the back, yes. Could you uh, explain your specific plans to change health care? I'm sorry? Could you please explain your specific plans to change health care? Oh, sure. Specific plans to change health care. So one, we know that the premiums are too high. Um, on the marketplace, which is the Obamacare plans, um, the first year that those programs were around, uh, there was a lot of choices. So you could pick between Blue Cross and Aetna and United Healthcare and all these different companies. Uh, but over time, that level of choice has gone away. So right now, there's only one option, which is Blue Cross for our whole area. And that's because there was a program that was designed to be part of the ACA that was fully funded at the beginning, but now doesn't, is not being fully funded. And it's been part of the sabotage of the ACA because it's no secret, right, the congressional Republicans don't like the Affordable Care Act. They want it gone. They voted to repeal it 60 plus times um, and, or defund. And so this is one of the things that happened as a consequence. And as a result, when you have lower competition, right, only one choice or maybe two, prices are higher because those companies don't have to compete with other people on price. Um, and so it's really expensive and out of reach for a lot of families. So one solution is to make sure that that program is fully funded, that allows for competition, gives um, insurance companies an incentive to try to sell their product to the consumers who want to buy it. Uh, the second thing around the drug prices. So when I was working in the Obama administration, I told you how we worked on Flint, but we also worked on bioterrorism threats, smallpox and anthrax and other agents like that. And so we would work with prescription drug companies to incentivize them and to work with them to develop new treatments against those bioterrorism agents, new vaccines, because wouldn't it be great if everybody in America could get vaccinated against anthrax so that it could never hurt us? I think that'd be great. Or new diagnostic tools. So if there was a smallpox exposure, there should be a rapid test to find out if you have it. I mean, smallpox you would know. But for example, there's some agents where you wouldn't know right away. Um, and so as a result of those negotiations, well, I should say the federal government under the Obama administration decided that we were not going to investigate and invest in products that did not have a peacetime use. So yeah, it's cool that it works for smallpox or anthrax, but if it doesn't help day to day, that might not be the best use of our taxpayer resources. And so as a result, the drug companies would come in for negotiations and they were willing to spend money on research and development to get to that peacetime use because they knew that the federal government was their largest client. And the federal government was gonna be buying their products in bulk and putting it in the strategic national stockpile. And so as a result of those negotiations, there's now a product in the stockpile that will treat antibiotic resistant gonorrhea and cure smallpox. That happened because of the negotiations. So I think that the same premise applies. We know that right now, today, the federal government is the single largest payer for healthcare services in the United States. They pay the majority of prescription drug prices. And so if we can get those costs under control and lower it for consumers, we know that the commercial market maps really closely with what the federal government does in terms of pricing and claims and all those things. So we can see savings for consumers. I think it's really important. Final thing is mental health. So we know that our area has been touched by the opioid crisis pretty badly, actually. And um, I believe that we have to treat addiction as a disease 
not a law enforcement only approach. Um, and so there's, um, in Kendall County where Yorkville and Oswego are, they don't have a hospital. And so, and we're in Kane County now, obviously. And so if someone overdoses in Oswego, they get taken by ambulance to Rush Conflict Medical Center in Aurora. And if they die as a result of their overdose, their death gets logged on record from the hospital in Kane County, not in Kendall County where they live, where they use, where they overdosed. So why is that bad? Well, the federal grant system gives out resources to communities based on need. It's called a competitive grant. The communities that can demonstrate need get resources. And so Kane County has a disproportionate number of deaths on record just because they have a hospital. Not necessarily, necessarily, because they have a larger problem. Does that make sense? And so they're getting more money than Kendall County. And it's pitting communities against each other, which I think is wrong. This is affecting everybody. So communities should have the resources that they need to be able to fight back. Second thing is uh, insurance plans uh, generally only cover either detox or rehab. The thing with opioids is that you can't detox from them, sober up, if you will, right, at home. People have to go into the hospital for that. Get in the IV and get some medication and supervision from the nurses and stuff like that. So a lot of people are using their benefits just to detox. And so when it comes time to go to treatment, to go to rehab, if they don't have a home, like a house that their family owns, they have to go to drug courts or they have to go to jail um, because their family is not able to self-pay for treatment, which could be $50,000. Um, and that's an unfair disparity just based on owning a home in a community like this. Uh, and so I think that we should have insurance companies providing a benefit for both detox and rehab because for this kind of a drug crisis, you need both. A lot of the policies were designed to deal with different kind of drug crises, right? Remember, back in the day, people were alcoholics and the majority of substance use was in alcoholism. And if somebody needed to detox from alcohol, they could generally do it at home. They didn't necessarily need to go to the hospital for that. That kind of a system works or other drug you know, crack and all these other things over history, they didn't necessarily need to go to the hospital to be able to um, detox before they went to treatment. And this is just different, but our system's not keeping up with it. So I think it's important to make that change. Other questions? Yes, sir. So if you're elected, mm -hmm. how are you going to um, equip, to equip the schools for, um, safety of the um, students and staff. Yeah. What do you think we should do? Um, just a, uh, like for the staff that are willing to protect the schools and like have a mental and a physical evaluation to actually um, to use a gun and all that stuff like after every single year. Okay. Or just stuff like that just for the, just for safety. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't share your view because we have a lot of schools, Batavia is not necessarily one of them, but a lot of schools where the school doesn't have new textbooks. There's no funding for that. Students don't have modern computers. They're sitting here with these desktop monitors that are bigger than like one of these bookshelves almost, right? It's so old. They don't have updated equipment. Um, a lot of schools where teachers are being asked to pay out of pocket for supplies. And I think it's wrong for the federal government to ask for that, right? For teachers to make personal financial sacrifices and for students to go without educational resources and then for the federal government to pay for a gun for teachers to have in every classroom. I think that's wrong. I also think that um, a lot of teachers signed up to teach, to teach, not to be security. And I think that we can have measures that will keep students safe in school 
um, like having officers, if that's what that school district wants, police officers on their campus. Um, but I don't think it should be the teacher's responsibility uh, to do that. But I do think that we are in the middle of epidemic levels of gun violence. And it makes me really scared for the future of our country. I've talked to a lot of students, and you guys tell me what your experience has been, but especially the younger kids, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh graders, who've been scared at the end of last year to go back to school this year because of the increasing number of shootings in schools. And um, I don't think that kids should ever have to worry about going to school. And so I think we have to be serious about uh, common sense uh, gun reforms. So like universal background checks to make sure that people who shouldn't have weapons can't get them. Um, about closing gun show loopholes. So if, you, if someone wants to purchase a weapon, it should be the same requirements, in my opinion. If you want to buy it in a store versus online versus at a gun show, which is like a fair, or um, from their friend. You should have to show the same proof of identity, have to take the same classes, or whatever the requirements are, they should have to be the same. Um, because people are taking advantage of these loopholes, and people who shouldn't have guns are getting them and are hurting a lot of people. Um, but I'm really, I'm really committed to this issue, and I'm hoping that we can, if elected, we can really um, put a stop to it because it is outrageous, and I'm so sorry that this is happening um, during your time in high school and that you, know, you have to do these active shooter drills and all this other stuff. Um, it's really alarming, and our country needs to step up and make some changes for you guys. Unfortunately, we only have time for one more question. Great. Okay, guys, yes. So how do you feel about Illinois being um, broke? I'm sorry? How do you feel about Illinois being how do I feel about Illinois being broke? Yeah, I don't feel good about that. I think it's unacceptable, but I'm running for Congress. So we don't do anything with the budget in Springfield. Um, and I think that as voters, first time voters, you all have the opportunity to make a decision about the future of our state and the circumstances that we've been going through. Um, and you know, do you wanna make a change or not? And so I think that if that's important to you, that you look at not just the governor's candidates, gubernatorial candidates, but who's running for state senate, and who's running for state rep, and who's running for controller, and who's running for treasurer, right? There's a lot of people that work on this issue on the ballot. They're all on the ballot this year. And there's some real differences in their perspectives on this issue. So that's my answer. I want to thank you all so much for your good questions. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you. I want to close by just saying two things. One, I know that um, a lot of people are encouraging you to vote because that's what you should do. Um, I think that you should vote because this is the chance for you to have a say. The one chance for you to be able to um, influence what happens for the next two or four years. And um, I hope to earn your support, but I know that's not a given. The second thing I want to say is that I want you all to think about the ways that you can give back to our community and to our country. Doesn't mean you have to do what I'm doing and run for office. But this only works if we all participate. And one of the great ways for you to participate is to vote. But there's other things that you can do in addition to voting. Um, so just start thinking about what that is and ways that you can continue to be an engaged citizen um, because we, we need you and we need your ideas and your leadership. Thank you guys. <laughs>